Um, today we're going to be talking about um, Gettier, Edmund Gettier's famous paper, um, Is Knowledge Justified True Belief? Um, I'm gonna sp it's a very short paper, super famous, super influential. Um, I'm going to split the lecture though into two very short videos. I want to try to do some shorter videos. I keep coming out with these 20 minute videos. I'm aiming for like 10 for this one. So let's see how I do. So Gettier's paper is about providing a counterexample to a very famous and influential and very old analysis of knowledge. And what does it mean to give a counterexample to analysis of knowledge? Is this to say that the analysis doesn't capture the phenomenon that we're trying to explain. Um, and so in order to set up this topic of conversation, I need to um, take a little time to go over the idea of a conceptual analysis and explain what a counterexample would be. And so I'm going to try to just focus for this video on explaining what the traditional analysis of knowledge is, including a quick recap of uh, what goes into doing an analysis. And I'll talk about at the end what what would be required to give a counterexample to that analysis. And then in the next lecture, I will talk about Gettier's counterexamples in, in closer detail. Okay, that's the plan. It's kind of a nice day out and you can really tell because the streets are crowded. I have to keep walking into the road to avoid coming within six feet of somebody. <sighs> okay, so the traditional way to go about giving it a conceptual analysis is by appealing to these tools that I talked about on the first day of class. Um, <clears throat> that's not the first lecture, but way back before we were online. And uh, the concepts are necessary and sufficient conditions. Uh, so brief review, a necessary condition um, and a sufficient condition are, are both types of conditions on a further proposition, let's say. So let's, let's say that they're propositions. And so the truth of one has a relationship with the truth of another. So a necessary condition is one which is necessary for the truth of the other thing. And a sufficient condition is one which is sufficient for the truth of the other thing. They're actually really hard for people to remember and keep straight, even though they say right in their name what they do. Um, but so really brief like recap of the examples I was using to explain on the first day, right? Having four sides is a necessary condition on being a square. It's not a sufficient condition because you can have four sides without being a square. Um, a sufficient condition for being a square would be a kind of complex thing. It has four equal sides and four equal angles. Angles. Um, so something which satisfies that um, it suffices to make it a square. Um, <clears throat> having four sides is a necessary condition on being a square, though, because nothing is a square which doesn't have four sides. So you have to have that condition satisfied. It's necessary. So when you give an analysis, you want to have... Um, a set of conditions which are each necessary, they call it independently necessary. In other words, you can't have the thing you're defining without satisfying each of these conditions. And moreover, if you satisfy all the conditions of the definition or the analysis, that's sufficient for getting the thing that you're trying to define or analyze. So in that case, when we're trying to give an analysis of knowledge, we want to um, formulate a set of conditions which are each necessary for the possession of knowledge and which if you satisfy all of them, that's sufficient for you to have knowledge. Okay, so <clears throat> the way this is traditionally set up and the way that Gettier sets it up is with the schematic sentence form, S knows that P. That's what we're trying to, to give necessary and sufficient conditions for. S knows that P is true if and only if, and then you list your necessary conditions that are jointly sufficient for knowledge. So if you've got a good analysis of knowledge, then the conditions that you list out, each of them is necessary. And if you put them together, it's sufficient for the truth of the other thing. So let's, let's talk for a second about what S knows that P means. So S knows that P is a schematic sentence. You can put anything in for S, which is an agent. So any person can be inserted for the S. And P stands for a variable. S stands for subject. And P is a variable that stands for, sorry, for proposition. So propositions are the things that can be known, like um, that it's not freezing out, 
or that the speed of light is 180,000 kilometers per, per second or um, that Boston is in Massachusetts. Those are all examples of propositions. So an S can go for any anybody. So um, it can be, you know, the president knows that Boston is in Massachusetts or um, Derek knows that he's outside right now. So um, that's the kind of thing that goes on the left. And then the idea of giving the analysis of those claims is to say when they are true. So what conditions have to be satisfied such that it's true that Derek knows he's outside. So that's the success condition for an analysis of knowledge. It has to give you conditions which are satisfied in all and only the cases where S knows that P. <clears throat> now, it's not that S knows that P is always true. So, um, like, <clears throat> Consider this, the schematic substitution case. Like Derek knows that climate change is a hoax. Um, that sentence is false. I don't even believe that it's a hoax. I think it, it's real. Um, so in that case, since the sentence is false, Derek knows that climate change is a hoax. One of the conditions that I'm gonna lay out has to be false too. So. Um, the analysis, basically, it's like you get S knows that P if and only if set of conditions. And that means any time that that one's false, this one is false. The set is false. Uh, set of sentences is false. Um, I shouldn't say it that way. The set isn't really technically true or false. But the sentence made from conjoining the conditions is false. Technicality, but it's good to be precise. <laughs> All right, so in keeping with the tradition of classical epistemology, tradition which we're gonna interrogate later, I'm gonna start with the blandest example that I can think of, um, which is <coughs> Derek knows he's outside right now. Okay, so <coughs> now I'm gonna take us through the three necessary, and supposedly jointly su sufficient conditions that belong to the traditional analysis of knowledge. Condition one. The belief has to be true. So P has to be true. Um, when I say S knows the P, Derek knows that he's outside. It has to be true that Derek's outside in order for it to count as knowledge. So in other words, if I'm actually asleep right now in my bed, I, I believe that I'm outside, but it's not true that I'm outside. I'm actually in my bed inside. So you can only know things that are true. Um, likewise, if I, if I think about climate change is a hoax, that proposition, uh, I, assuming that it's false that climate change is a hoax, in other words, climate change really is happening, um, I can't know that climate change is a hoax because it's false that climate change is a, change is a hoax. Um, so this is what they sum, you can sum this up by saying uh, knowledge entails or implies truth. So if you know that P, then P must be true. That's the first condition. Okay, the second condition on S knows that P is that S has to believe P. If S doesn't believe P, then S doesn't know P. Um, so if we go back to the case that I'm outside and the question is, does Derek know that he's outside? A necessary condition on my know knowledge that I'm outside is that I believe that I'm outside. If I actually, in some kind of crazy state, think that I'm not actually outside right now, I was on drugs or something and I just did not believe that I was outside. I thought I was in some room someplace and this was an illusion. If I really believed that um, and I didn't believe that I was outside, then I couldn't know that I was outside. Um, that's kind of a weird example, but let's take uh, climate change as a hoax. I really don't believe that climate change is a hoax, but it's possible that it's a hoax. If it is true that it's a hoax, then I definitely don't know it because I don't believe it. So. Um, if someone doesn't believe something, if someone doesn't believe a proposition is true, then they definitely don't know that it's true. That's the thought anyway. So um, knowledge entails belief. It's another necessary condition. S believes that P. So, so far we have P is true. S believes that P. 
Now we might um, ask whether true belief is sufficient for knowledge. What that would mean is to say that the two conditions we came up with already are enough. If you satisfy both of them, then you have knowledge. So if you have a true belief, does that count as knowledge? So let's change the example again. Um, this time I want to think about the proposition is that Derek's car has been stolen. Um, and I swear I, I don't believe that my car has been stolen right now. But let's pretend that I just suddenly get this paranoid impulse. Just walking around here, I just get this gut feeling that, I, uh, that my car was stolen. Um, and let's not, let's, let's guess, let's just say that I don't have any paranormal abilities. I just have like normal human mental capacities and I have no way of remote viewing that my car has been stolen or anything like that. In other words, I'm just purely coming up with this idea out of nowhere. Now let's also pretend though that my car did get stolen. So now I formed a true belief. I believe that my car was stolen and it was stolen. But the question is, do I know it? I mean, if I formed it on the basis of nothing at all, just a paranoid uh, fantasy, the idea is, or I'm trying to get at it, is that that wouldn't count as knowledge. Just merely forming a true belief out of nowhere um, doesn't count as knowledge. You have to have something else. Uh, let me try and give you another example because for some reason that one seems weird to me right now. Okay, let's take this random house that I'm walking by and I want to pick a name out of a hat uh, more or less and say, let's say that um, uh, Dan Montana lives there where Dan Montana is just a random portmanteau of uh, Dan Marino and Joe Montana. Uh, I don't know why I thought of that. Okay, so then my belief, I'm just gonna randomly choose to believe that Dan Montana is the name of the person who lives there. Okay, so now considering my belief that Dan Montana lives in that blue house on the corner, um, suppose, let's just pretend for the sake of the example that the person who lives there really is named Dan Montana. I mean, I just made it up though. <laughs> I, I might be right if I just happened to pick the right name and I have a true belief, that doesn't count as knowledge or so the thought goes. I, true belief is not sufficient for knowledge. We need a, a third condition. Um, so even though true, true belief is necessary for knowledge, it's not sufficient, it's not enough, it doesn't get you all the way there. So the third condition that people have traditionally added is to say that um, the belief has to be justified or supported by some kind of good epistemic reason, some good reason to believe it. Um, it might be a empirical evidence or a good argument or something that actually the nature of what is justification is kind of left open by this uh, analysis. But the third condition is that S has to be justified in believing that P. <laughs> Okay, so those are the three conditions. P must be true, S must believe P, and S must be justified in believing P. And in the traditional analysis, that's, those are three are jointly sufficient. So in other words, if all three of those are true, then S knows that P. People are coming from all directions. <laughs> did some fancy footwork to dodge everybody <laughs> coming together at this intersection. Okay, where was I? Right, okay, I think that we've gotten the full analysis on the table now. That's the full traditional analysis. Oh, I think I was gonna explain, right, so if S knows the P is false, then at least one of those three conditions has to be false. But if all three of those conditions are true, then S knows that P has to be true. So that's what it is to give a necessary and sufficient condition analysis of knowledge. Okay. So next what I want to talk about, and then I'm going to leave off for the next video, the, the continuation of this thought, what would constitute a counterexample to the analysis? What I'm trying to look for then is a case in which either S knows that P, but one of the conditions isn't satisfied, or a case in which all three of the conditions are satisfied, but S doesn't know that P. Those are the two different kinds of counterexamples you can have to an analysis, and they correspond to denying that the conditions are necessary or that they're sufficient. Okay, so if you come up with an example of a person like S knows that P, uh, which is true, but one of the conditions is false, 
then you've shown that that condition is not necessary. In other words, you can have knowledge without having that condition. If you do the other thing, which is you find a case where all of the um, conditions are satisfied, but S doesn't know that P, that's a case where you've shown that the analysis wasn't sufficient, that the conditions you came up with, you can satisfy all of them without getting S knows that P. All right, I want to try to give a uh, sort of vary the example so that we have intuitions going into the uh, counterexample knowledge case. So let's say that my, I'm giving an analysis of life, different concept. What does it mean to be alive? And here's my analysis that I just make up right now is um, X is alive if and only if X is breathing. Um, now, is that a good analysis? I think it's not. Um, so what is a counterexample to that? I mean, maybe I'm getting a little confused here, but like, I don't think that plants breathe, although maybe someone will say that they do breathe. Let me change my analysis to be even dumber. So uh, to be alive is to have air going in and out of your lungs. So now it's very clear that plants don't satisfy that definition, but plants are still alive. So now what we have is a case where um, X is alive, but the definition wasn't satisfied. They don't have lungs that, with air going in and out of them, but they're alive. That shows that it's a bad analysis. It shows that having lungs where air is going in and out of them is not necessary for life. You have an example of something which is alive, which doesn't have the feature that you said was necessary and sufficient for uh, uh, being alive. Okay, so let's try a different, different uh, analysis. This time I'm gonna say that um, to be alive is to change. Is that a good analysis? I think plausibly someone might say, uh, that's a bad analysis because <clears throat> you can find things that change which aren't alive, like the status of like a hurricane or something. I mean, it's changing. It went from a category four to a category five, but is a hurricane alive? Most people are gonna say it's not alive. Um, <clears throat> so this is an example where the condition you gave is not sufficient for being alive. Because changing, you can have something which is changing, but it's false that the thing is alive. So that's an example where it's, the condition is not sufficient. The last example is one where it wasn't necessary. So to say that it's not sufficient is to say that you can satisfy that thing without um, making true the thing you're, you're analyzing. Okay, just, just wanna go a little bit deeper into this concept. So if someone's gonna argue against a counterexample like this, they would have to argue that in fact, hurricanes are alive. In other, in other words, to defend that as a sufficient condition would mean to say, no, actually, if it changes, then it's alive. And whether or not that argument can be carried out effectively is a separate question. Um, this is going to be related to the um, issue at hand because the types of examples that Gettier gives, uh, counterexamples to the classical definition of knowledge, are against the sufficiency of it. So he's trying to come up with cases in which it's false that S knows that P, but where the conditions are satisfied. So it's, it's analogous to the, um, the hurricane changes, but it's not a life kind of case. Um, so if someone was going to respond to Gettier's type of argument, they would have to show that uh, those are cases of knowledge or else they would have to add something to the set of necessary conditions and a fourth condition such that if you add up all four of them, now you have something that's, um, that counts as knowledge. One more time, I'm just gonna summarize the situation that we're, the point where we, we've reached. I've laid out what the um, traditional analysis of knowledge is, it's called JTB, because justified true belief. S knows that P, if and only if P is true, S believes that P, and S is justified in believing that P. And then we're gonna look at, in the next lecture, is um, Gettier's argument that this is not a, that is a bad analysis because the conditions are not jointly sufficient. In other words, you can find a case where all three of the conditions are satisfied, but yet the person still doesn't know. Okay. All right, that's all. I gotta get off the street. I'll see you later.